We have a love-hate relationship with mushrooms. They add great dimensions to our cuisine, our consciousness, and are an essential component of all our planet's ecosystems. And we love them for that. But we hate them because, frankly, they scare us. With the legendary dangers associated with mistaken identity, identification is a process that few people are willing to undertake. An ignorant mushroom hunter sometimes ends up sick or dead. And since most of us are ignorant in the ways of hunting wild mushrooms, at least some of our fears appear warranted. Enter the Shroom Hunter video course. A multi-part curriculum of mushroom hunting ins and outs designed to help replace our prevailing ignorance with knowledge and fear with favor. Shroom Hunter 101 is the first class in this series, an introduction to the world of mushroom hunting. It's for beginners concerning itself with the process of collecting mushrooms and making observations. A mushroom hunting primer covering the basic language of a mushroom's structure and basic natural tendencies. An important first step in undertaking to identify any mushroom. But it's only that, a first step. The amount of information required by a mushroomer to make an unequivocal identification simply cannot be contained in a 30-minute videotape. So this course is designed to be used in conjunction with a quality field guide. If you want to apply the information you gain here, a good book is a must. A list of such publications can be found at your local or online bookstore or at our website. If you're going to hunt mushrooms, you need to know what you're looking for. So it needs a name, right? The Latin names given by the mushroom's discoverer, or author, provide hunters a common language with which to describe and distinguish mushroom genera and species. Identifying a mushroom all the way down to its species can be difficult even for the most accomplished mushroom hunter, as a microscope is often necessary to make a concrete identification. So for our purposes, we're going to focus mostly on the genus of a given mushroom. Knowing genus is usually enough to keep a hunter safe and is certainly the place to start if your intentions are to take up mushroom hunting as a regular pastime. First, identify the three W's of your mushroom's environment. When is your mushroom growing? Where is the mushroom? What is it growing in or on? Next, make a note of how it's growing. Is it clumped together with other mushrooms? Are they attached at the base to one another? Or just growing in close proximity to one another? Or solitary? Now pick the mushroom. For identification purposes, it's best to get the whole mushroom. So dig with your finger under the mushroom's base. Now bear in mind that in some states, in the US, it is illegal to pick certain kinds of mushrooms. So before yanking, check up on your local laws. Now you're looking at the mushroom up close. Measure it. How big or small is it? What color is it? Anything about its odor stand out? Is it slimy or dry? Is it a brittle or tough mushroom? What does the cap look like? The stem? Does anything remarkable pop out at you? Does it have gills under its cap? And if so, are there a whole bunch of them, tightly packed together? Or are they spaced out? Do they attach to the stem? Is it staining any noticeable color where damaged? There are times when even the most adept mushroomers have a tough time making identifications through these casual observations alone. 
That is why it is always important to do the following. Take a spore print. When you bring the mushroom home, separate the cap from the stem and then place the mushroom's cap on top of a clean sheet of paper. If you suspect that the mushroom might produce a white spore print, you should use a piece of black paper, otherwise use a clear true white. You can put a drop of water on the top of the cap if it appears to be drying out, or cover it with a glass. In 30 to 60 minutes, take a look at the color of the spores that have dropped from the gills onto the paper, the spore print. This is one of the most important keys to a mushroom's visual identification. Very few macroscopic markers have the sort of reliability that a spore print does. The spore print varies from genus to genus, from orange to black to white to purple to brown, and is one of the most consistent assets in the hunt for a genus identification. But not necessarily species identification. This is where spore prints fall short. They, like any single identification marker, are inadequate for telling you a mushroom species. The genus Agaricus, for example, has somewhere between 20 and 30 species within its ranks. But you can't tell the difference between the spore print colors of the Agaricus bisporus and the Agaricus californicus, not unless you put it under a microscope. Just getting a spore print is an important milestone in the identification of a mushroom. In order to get your print, you've had to pick the mushroom, and in order to pick the mushroom, you've had to look at it, and in order to look at it, you've had to locate it. So by getting to the spore printing phase of identification, you've run the course of macroscopic observation from start to finish. But before we attempt an ID, we have to first talk about some of mushroom hunting's inherent risks. Of the many thousands of species of mushrooms populating the United States and Europe, only about a hundred are reported to be poisonous. And of these, about a dozen are considered deadly. Among the poisonous species, the chemicals that we're calling toxins vary widely in structure and effect. From ibotenic acid, which causes fever-like delusions, sweating, and the occasional muscular paralysis, to amine toxins, which cause renal failure, coma, and usually death. To the so-called hallucinogens, psilocybin, and psilocin. Indeed, mushrooms produce some very different sorts of chemicals, some of which are dangerous, some just taboo, but all are worth knowing about and worth watching out for. Shroom Hunter 101 explores one of these toxic mushroom genera in its lab. In the next half of the program, we've chosen the genus psilocybe because of its confusing reputation. And technically speaking, it's probably the genus most responsible for mushroom poisonings in the US and Europe. Though many of these intoxications are intentional, many are not. And in any case, this genus is one that mushroom hunters should know how to identify. That said, we urge you to approach the process of identification with confidence and patience. It will come to you if your interest is genuine. The process of identifying wild mushrooms is not for the simple-minded. It is far from foolproof, and mistakes can be terrifying even deadly. Keep your eyes open and use common sense and deductive reasoning. Now on to the first lab section of our course, where we put these observations to use in identifying some temperate mushrooms. It's always best to define your search before embarking on your hunt. You might never succeed in finding the quarry you set out to collect, 
but the very fact that you're setting up parameters will aid you in the identification of whatever you do find. For the purposes of this lab, we know only that our minds are set on finding members of the genus Psilocybe. We don't have specific species in mind, but knowing the genus gets us started and provides a couple of basic visual and tactile markers to assist us in our hunt. The basic data, small, brownish, gilled, mushroom, in lawns or in disturbed soil, wood chips or the like, often containing psychoactive alkaloids like psilocybin and psilocin, and sometimes marked with bluish discolorations where bruised or damaged. Like most mushrooms, psilocybes thrive in areas of high annual rainfall and relatively high humidity. They can be found in tropical, subtropical, and temperate regions of the world, and are known from every continent except Antarctica. To cover all these species in one video lab would be at best tedious, and at worst, impossible. So this lab, the first in the Shroom Hunter video course, will focus on a specific niche of some of the most common psilocybes, the urban-dwelling temperate varieties. This group of mushrooms thrive in temperate weather zones, regions where climactic conditions are characterized by cooler, wetter winters, and within the classic common urban environments known in mycocentric circles as disturbed habitats. These sites are mostly landscape territories, lawns, enriched soils, decorative wood chips and bark, and in yard and construction waste, places where psilocybes can help vegetal matter decompose. The most common of these find themselves growing in settings around the bases of small trees and shrubs, along the shady drip lines of buildings, anywhere there is adequate moisture and some obstacles to the loss of humidity, things like walls, branches, leaves. These psilocybes flourish in areas where annual rainfall is high and where seasonal changes are announced with dramatic variations in the color and quantity of sunlight and with glaring changes in air temperature. Snow is common in many temperate zones. Temperatures that dip well below freezing can be expected at least a few days out of the year. These temperatures don't seem to adversely affect the spores or the mycelium they spur. And though we might think that hot, sunny summers will do great harm to a temperate mushroom's life cycle, this is not necessarily the case. In areas of high annual rainfall, the relatively short period of warmer, drier, longer summer days actually seem to act as a sort of cue to some mushrooms to grow their mycelium and get ready to fruit. When the temperatures drop again and the rains begin to fall, that's when the action really begins. Though mushrooms grow at different times of the year, the vast majority of temperate mushrooms, including psilocybes, fruit primarily in autumn and into early winter. If you're into mushrooms, fall is sure to be your favorite time of year. Shroom Hunter 101, however, begins its field lab in the spring. It's mid-April, and you're visiting a friend in Salisbury, England, just southwest of London. And as you're walking along a sidewalk, your friend points at a hose lying near a row of bushes. More specifically, he's pointing at something right next to the hose. A couple of small brown mushrooms. They're hard to see at first. Their dull brown hygrophonous caps blending in well with the woody soil out of which they're growing. But once your eyes focus in on them, you realize that they aren't just growing by this hose. They're everywhere. They're growing around the bases of bushes, out in the open, up against a sidewalk, a hundred specimens or more. You bend down to take a closer look at one bunch. You observe their sesquipedose growing habit. Their viscid, shiny caps with a thin striate margin, which in the larger, older specimens actually lifts up around the edges. You pick a clump of them and notice that the stems are bending out of a single clustered base, and midway up that stem, there's a little ring called an annulus. You plop a couple into your pocket 
and you head back to your friend's home. Once there, your friend places a cap from one of the specimens, gills down on a piece of white paper, and walks off to find his trusty field guide. Running through a list of mushroom descriptions, he shows you how to figure out what kind of mushroom this is. It's fruiting in the spring. It's a small, brown, gilled mushroom with a clustered growth habit, loving wood-mulched soil. It has a hygrophonous cap with a striate margin and a hollow stem with an annulus and a swollen base, bending out of a central communal clump. You gently tear the cap and find a thin film called a pellicle covering the top of the mushroom. In the half hour or so that you've been doing your homework, the cap has dropped a load of its spores and the telltale purple color of the spore print confirms your best guess. You've got psilocybe stuntsii. Now, summer has come and gone, and you find yourself back home in Portland, Oregon, in the United States. And inspired by your British mushroom experience, you find yourself compelled to pay attention to wild mushrooms in a way that you hadn't before. It's early October, and the rains definitely come and brought with them the first cold days of fall. And so, one morning, you find yourself walking through one of the city's many parks, and you notice a bunch of small brown mushrooms growing out of a young lawn. The resemblance to the mushrooms you found in England is undeniable. Similar brownish caps, a thinning, striate margin, veil remnants on the stem. They're slightly more flimsy and a bit smaller, but otherwise they seem identical. But these mushrooms were found in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in the autumn and are growing out of grass. Is it possible that these mushrooms are the same species? You list all the obvious visual markers. Small brown gilled mushroom, clustered growth habit, loving grass, hygrophonous cap with a striate margin and a hollow stem with a persistent annulus and a swollen base bending out of a central clump. And the spore print is purple. You sit down with your brand new mushroom field guide, and it says it all. There is a psilocybe that grows out of both grass and woody substrate in both autumn and spring, and is found in the Pacific Northwest, the United Kingdom, and much of Western Europe, even Australia. You have indeed found psilocybe stuntsii. This time, a grass lover. It's a few weeks later. It's late October, and you're walking with your family through an urban park in Vancouver, British Columbia. When Uncle John notices something growing in a nearby patch of grass, he calls over and points down at the sod, smiling. You walk over and find this. At first you think maybe it's one of those little ubiquitous Mycena or Copernus species that your field guide has been helping you identify. Its small, delicate shape and its color, kind of grayish, bluish brown. Its solitary growth habit. But good old Uncle John knows otherwise. You pick one, and you realize that the stem isn't nearly as brittle as a Mycena or a Copernus, and it's slightly twisted. You look at it a bit and notice its cap's distinct shape, with a margin that's sort of thin and flimsy. It sounds familiar, but you're not sure what it is. So you take one back to the hotel to find out. You run through the list of markers. It's a small, grayish-brown mushroom with gills. It has a solitary growth habit in the grass, a hygrophonous cap with a thin, flimsy, striate margin, a hardy, whitish stem with a tendency to twist as it goes up, and a distinct bluing reaction where damaged. The spore print, purple-brown in color, 
There is one psilocybe that fits the description of your notes, but the pictures in the field guides don't really look all that much like the mushroom you found. Then it occurs to you, perhaps it doesn't look like the pictures you've seen in books, because the pictures you've seen in books are almost always of this species growing out of wood chips or woody soils, and yours came from a lawn. And this species does indeed grow from both. It's just like with the stuntsii you found. This mushroom's shape, size, and habit has been affected by what it's growing out of. You found a grass-dwelling psilocybe baocystis. It's early November, and you're riding your bikes to a coffee shop. And you look over at a planting area, and you see these. To the untrained eye, they look like a bunch of leaves scattered across the ground. But these aren't leaves. You bent down to take a closer look. They're growing in wood mulch scattered across the top of soil. Some of the specimens are small and growing independently, but the majority of these mushrooms are growing in bunches, several mushrooms coming out of a single base. The larger specimens are growing up to three inches tall, with caps reaching out to about two and a half inches wide. And that cap is thick and relatively hardy with a deep caramel color and a very distinct, planing, wavy margin. The branching, bending, light-colored stems are also hardy and, like the cap, exhibit a strong bluing reaction where damaged. You take one specimen and perform the requisite spore print and thumb through your field guide. You make your list of obvious macroscopic features. A deep, caramel-colored hygrophonous cap with a wavy striated margin, bending, hardy, whitish stem, clustered growth habit, growing in wood mulch in the autumn, and it turns blue where damage, and leaves behind a deep purple spore print. This is a fairly easy mushroom to identify. It is one of the most potent species of hallucinogenic mushrooms in the world. And it can be found in many cool, wet environments, from Germany to the British Islands to the Pacific Northwest of the United States and Canada to Australia. This is a psilocybe cyanescence. The very next day, you're playing at a friend's house, not far from where you found those cyanescents, and you come across this. In very similar soil to that in which the cyanescents were growing, in exactly the same climate, and yet it is something else entirely, and you don't know what. You yank one out of the ground and you take it home. You pull out your trusty identification guide and fail to find anything that resembles this little mushroom. Your notes seem clear enough. It's a small, brownish mushroom with some olive-tinted regions, a compact, convex cap with the margin that tends to undulate, a long, hollow, grayish stem growing in a clustered habit from a single base and growing out of wood mulch in the autumn. And the spore print is purple. It's almost like a number of different mushrooms you find in your trusty field guide. Almost. Is it a baocystis with a strange growth habit and a thick, hollow, somewhat fragile stem? Or is it a weird stuntsy eye without the familiar ring around the stem? You bounce it off all the learned mushroom hunters you know and come up only with an identification of genus. It's a psilocybe. But what species? It's becoming clear that this is not a species that can be identified by macroscopic means. It's going to have to be looked at a lot closer. So you send this curious strain off to a reputable taxonomist, who does indeed put it under a microscope, looks at it, and sends back the word unequivocally. It's psilocybe cyanescence.
You'll notice that in this lab, we've paid especially close attention to the variations in the way a given species looks. We've done this for one simple reason, to remind you to pay close attention to what you're doing. There are many different kinds of mushrooms growing in these settings, and sometimes they don't look like they should. You must always be diligent and objective or risk hurting yourself or others with misidentification. This is by no means a full list of poisonous mushrooms, but those which we feel are most likely to find their way into your hunt as you endeavor to identify temperate urban psilocybes. Macroscopically speaking, the mushrooms listed here have some things in common with the psilocybes we've been looking at, but the color of the spore print isn't one of them. These mushrooms are the best and final reason for a would-be hunter of little brown mushrooms to run a spore print. A couple of these mushrooms can kill you. Look them up in your field identification guides. Get to know them. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Thank you for joining us here with Shroom Hunter 101. For courses on more advanced macroscopic identification techniques, covering this and related genera in greater detail, just look for other videos in the Shroom Hunter series. Happy hunting, and be safe. <laughs>